This happened to my mom maybe three years ago. My mom has now passed away, but she was maybe 40 at the time. She was a very pretty woman, looked young for her age. She often had total strangers propose to her. Everyone was pretty much obsessed with her. That being said, she was no stranger to dealing with creeps. So one day she was at a grocery store. It wasn't really in a bad area, but was close to a bad area right off the freeway, so it could be kind of sketchy. She always told me she didn't want me going there alone, especially at night. When I would go with her at night, I was not to leave her side, even though I was 20 years old at the time. She was at the store during the day, doing her grocery shopping alone. She noticed a man in the same aisle as her. He was looking at her, and when she would turn to look at him, he would look away and act like he was looking at something on the shelves. Honestly, she didn't think much of it. As I mentioned, she's dealt with her fair share of creeps. So she grabbed what she needed and moved on to another aisle. She noticed him again, in the same aisle as her, watching her and doing the same thing as before. This time, it kind of rubbed her the wrong way, but she went about her business and again moved on. The man kept following her throughout the store. Now it's worth mentioning that my mom was not one to be messed with. She was very confrontational and never backed away from a fight. She has beaten the shit out of men, taken beatings from men, and would usually carry a weapon. As she's getting ready to check out, she noticed he's still following her. By this point, she's pretty pissed off and didn't feel safe leaving. She alerted an employee who went to get a manager. My mom took this opportunity to tell the creep off, saying something along the lines of, Can I help you? What the f*** do you want? He replied to her saying, You look like the kind of girl who would look really good in someone's basement. At this point, she was not only mad, but absolutely terrified. The manager came, and while my mom was telling them about the guy and what he had said, he ran off. The police were called, and they were able to locate him just around the building. They escorted him off the property, but that was all. My mom was so afraid the guy was lurking somewhere, waiting to see her get into her car, and then proceed to follow her once he spotted her. She ended up calling me in tears, saying she was afraid, and if she was going to be followed or abducted, she wanted someone to know. We stayed on the phone until she was home. It took a lot to shake or scare my mom, but she had a really good intuition. So for her to be as shaken as she was, he had to be as creepy as they come. His comment to her only proved that further. In the end, she was okay, but I can't imagine what would have happened if she didn't tell someone or if he did wait for her outside of the store and follow her. This happened to me and my boyfriend about two years ago. We live in a city that has a main downtown area. The main city is pretty liberal, but once you get out into the county, it can become quite the opposite. That being said, the main city, and especially the downtown area, has a pretty bad homeless problem that's only gotten worse over the years. For the most part, the homeless population is pretty harmless. They know the good spots to hang out. A lot of times they just smile at you, and I always smile back you go on your way. Sadly, there has been an increase of incidents in the last few years with the rise of overdoses and more addictive street drugs. I was living in the main downtown area at the time, having just recently graduated college and wanting to be close to the nightlife. My best friend that I met in college and I were roommates, we had an apartment right in the middle of downtown. It was the perfect setup. My boyfriend, let's call him Jack, happened to live one block down, and then about five or six blocks south of that. It was about a ten minute walk, give or take. It was even closer to the heart of downtown as well. So you can imagine how convenient that made it for hanging out, and also not having to take a car and worry about parking. One overcast Sunday morning, my boyfriend and I woke up at my place and decided to walk over to his so that he could grab some things. We had walked the majority of the way, it really was just a straight walk on sidewalks the whole time. We were on the right side of the road with the street to our left. We're not one minute away from my boyfriend's place when I notice something ahead that makes me feel a bit uneasy. First off, there's a guy walking in front of us in the same direction we are, with his back to us. I can see he has both earbuds in. He's walking at about the same pace so we aren't about to run into him or anything. 
In front of him, facing and walking towards all of us, is a different guy. He had a small frame, of maybe five feet eight, wearing dark pants, a red sweatshirt with the hood up, and a backpack. Even though his hood was up, I could see his face. Some short black hair poked out, pale skin, and these black, beady, crazy eyes that I'll never forget. I assumed him to be homeless as it was an area that was popular for them. He wasn't looking at us, but rather the pedestrian with earbuds and who happened to be closer to him and in front of us. All of a sudden, I see the homeless guy run and quite literally rush the pedestrian in front of us. Like, ran up and then stopped about a half foot from this poor dude's face. Since the guy had his headphones in, he probably just wanted to mind his own business and walk home quietly. He was clearly taken by surprise and stopped and took one of his earbuds out to see what this crazy dude wanted. Me, while I'm a risk taker, I don't like putting myself in the wrong place when I don't need to be. This freaked me out and I didn't want the guy to notice us and come at us next, so I stepped left off the sidewalk into the street. There was a pretty big lane for street parking, and it was lined with parked cars, so I conveniently hid myself from view behind a car as I continued walking. I heard this guy start yelling obscenities at the poor pedestrian. Things like, I'm gonna run you over with a car. I'm going to find you. Like I said, we were not 100 feet from the entrance to my boyfriend's apartment at this point, and after witnessing that, I just wanted to be inside. My boyfriend had continued walking on the sidewalk, and in an instant I had come back in view, and we turned right towards the apartment. Now, the apartment did have a main entrance from the street side on the sidewalk, but my boyfriend had just moved in and didn't have the code for the front door yet. All he had was his fob to the parking garage that led to the stairwell up into the place. We were using that at the time to get in. We walked up to the parking garage door and clicked the button so it would start rolling up. I hadn't looked behind me at that point. I knew I probably should have, but a lot of times if you ignore the crazy people, they will in turn not bother you. So I was kind of following that tactic at the moment. The garage door was open and we went inside. My boyfriend clicked the button to close it. We started the short walk to the door to the stairwell. The garage door was nearly closed, and I don't know what prompted me to look back, but I did. And what I saw still gives me chills to this today. It was the homeless guy from the street. He was squeezing under the garage door while he still could. I remember the chill that ran down my spine as I locked eyes with his, and I yelled at my boyfriend, Jack, he's following us! I'm not sure what I expected my boyfriend to do, but he pushed the door to the stairwell open and started running. That was the oh sh moment when I realized this guy had access inside because the door to the stairwell didn't require a fob or have a lock. Me, definitely not wanting to be the closest one to this guy, took off running after my boyfriend. As I pushed the door open and got inside the stairwell, I could hear the guy behind me doing the same as it was swinging back closed. I looked back and locked eyes with this crazy guy once again, and about myself as I realized my only option was to keep running and try to get inside our apartment and close the door before he got there. Yes, this guy was smaller, but what really freaked me out is since he had a backpack, I had no idea if he had a knife or gun in there. I mean, sh Why else would you chase two people and outnumber yourself? My boyfriend lived on the third floor so we proceeded to sprint up three flights of stairs. I could hear this guy's pounding footsteps behind me. At last, we got to our level and opened to the door to the hallways and sprinted to his unit and without looking back, unlocked that door as fast as we could and slammed the door shut behind us. I remember looking through the peephole and expecting to see this guy standing there, ready to yell at us, but nothing. My heart was pounding. I mean, what the f just happened? We called the cops and told them what happened to us. I'll admit they probably did all they could, but it didn't feel like enough. I was freaked out. This dude now had access to and was inside the building with access to all the apartments and residents. I just imagined him hiding in the stairwell for the next poor soul. The cops came, 
drove around the perimeter of the complex for a few minutes, weren't able to search inside the building because apparently they didn't have access in and left after not finding anyone. It took me forever to get the urge to finally leave that apartment to go run our Sunday errands. But we did. I'm sure the guy was just high on drugs and decided to be crazy that morning and bother some unlucky people. He probably left after he realized he was screwed if people found him there and someone else called the cops. I am female and I was 20 years old at this time, living in an apartment with my mom and little brother while I attended community college. When we first moved in, the apartments were very well run, but within a short time the manager's was transferred elsewhere and his replacement did not have his skill at keeping undesirable types out. The police became a regular sight in our neighborhood and it was rare a day would go by without seeing them. The woman who moved in downstairs from us began openly dealing drugs. People would come and go at all hours and leave stuffing little bags of various substances into their pockets, mostly weed, but definitely other stuff as well. They could not have been more obvious if they tried. And there was always a crowd of shady looking men with large unfriendly dogs hanging around the yard or even sitting on our stairs. They'd act like it was a personal insult if we interrupted them to walk up or down our stairs and would be generally quite intimidating. The breaking point didn't come until their customers started getting the wrong address and coming to our door instead. We'd be sitting in the living room and hear footsteps come up the stairs and the doorknob would turn and jiggle against the lock. We became religious about keeping the door locked tight. One night I was home alone and somebody started just beating on the door. Not knocking, it was more like he thought it was a punching bag, all the while screaming barely comprehensible obscenities. I grabbed the biggest butcher knife out of the kitchen and shouted through the door that I was calling 911, and he ran away. After that, though, I always pushed the couch in front of the door before I went to bed. Mom had had enough. She tried going to the manager first and was met with a total lack of interest from her so she decided there was nothing to be done but contact the police about it herself. So she called about it and got off the phone looking happy, because they at least seemed to take her seriously and promised to investigate. The first sign of trouble came the next night. There was a lot of thumping and bumping downstairs, and a peek out the window showed people going in and out of the apartment, carrying cardboard boxes to a dented van on the street. Bright and early the next morning, the police raided the place, and you guessed it, clean as a whistle. At first, we didn't realize the implications of this. When it started back up again a few days later, Mom called the cops again, and the same thing happened. At this point, we realized it probably wasn't a coincidence. Somebody in the local police department was most likely tipping them off, one of the curses of a small town. I was angry and disappointed, but at least we'd tried, right? About a week later, I was getting ready for an evening class. I'd just gotten out of the shower and I was in my bedroom in a bathrobe and picking out what I wanted to wear. I heard a loud banging on the front door, but didn't think much of it. We'd been expecting a package and the UPS man always knocked loudly. My mom's footsteps went to answer it and I hear her say something. I couldn't make out the words, but her tone caught my attention and I felt like something was wrong. I reached for my door, but before I could open it, it flew open in my face. All my shocked brain could grasp was huge man with gun in my bedroom, before I was grabbed by the shoulders and flung to the floor. I honestly thought the druggies downstairs had come to get us once and for all. I thought I was about to be ripped and murdered. At this point, I should mention, I'd had an issue with one of my wrists for years due to a childhood injury. I'd had it operated on twice, and this was not more than a few months after the second operation. Naturally, I managed to land with my full weight on that wrist, and something crunched horribly. I did what any tough person would do, and immediately burst into tears and sat there clutching my wrist, waiting to die. I guess I must not have looked very threatening like that, because he stepped back a bit. And that's when I saw the police on the front of his vest. The next few minutes were a bit of a blur. Somehow, I was herded out into my living room where my mom was, and the cop left without saying more than, 
Wait here. I was completely dazed. Mom was pretty much having hysterics, and there was all kinds of shouting and activity going on outside. After a short while, the cop returned and informed us. Sorry, wrong address. Shit happens. We can't be perfect all the time. My name is Officer Ravender. Here's my card, and you can call if you have any questions. I went straight to the emergency room and spent the next two hours getting my wrist x-rayed and put into a splint. And then I went to math class, because I didn't know what else to do, and I was terrified of being at home. Needless to say, I learned nothing whatsoever, but the support of my teacher and classmates was reassuring. The next morning, somebody knocked on the door. When my mom answered, it was Officer Ravender again. When I heard his voice, I started hyperventilating and went and hid in the bathroom, so I didn't hear what was said. But I heard when Mom slammed the door. She was absolutely furious. I had never seen her look so angry. Apparently, good old Officer Ravender had brought along a carefully prepared document he wished for us to sign that basically said we understood that it was all a terrible mistake and that we would not be seeking legal action. She told him to go to hell and shut the door in his face. Ten minutes later, the phone rang. It was one of the nurses at the emergency room, saying somebody claiming to be law enforcement had just come by trying to get copies of my ER visit records, but they didn't have permission to release those, and if I wanted him to have them, I'd have to come and sign the forms. Oh, hell no. Further questions revealed that yes, the man matched Officer Ravender's description, and furthermore, he had told the nurse that he was not the officer involved, but was investigating the incident. I started to find that pretty much everyone that I told my story to would get a funny look on their face and say, this cop, was his name Officer Ravender? And then they would launch into their own horror story about him. My high school teacher said he shot one of her former students during a marijuana bust and left him on the ground to bleed to death. But the other officer on the scene did first aid and saved his life. One of our neighbors said he dragged, said neighbor's disabled uncle down a flight of stairs by his feet, hitting his head on every concrete step. Another neighbor said Officer Ravender pulled him out of the shower by his hair and held a gun to his head over a parole violation. Google said he'd once been fired from nearby city for shooting a handcuffed man in the head, killing him. He claimed it was somehow self-defense and was fired but never charged with any crime. The medical bills for the ER visit and such ended up being over seven grand, and I didn't have insurance, so I basically had no choice but to file a suit. I found myself a lawyer and submitted a claim. And that's when it really hit the fan. We started getting disturbing phone calls at all hours of the night, sometimes just silence at the other end, or the sound of somebody breathing, and sometimes graphically sexual comments. When we stopped answering the phone, they just let it ring until the machine picked up, then immediately hang up and do it again. My mom went to her car one morning and opened the door, only to discover the handle had been coated in some kind of caustic chemical. She washed it off quickly, but still ended up with burns and an emergency room visit. I'd just gotten my permit and was out for driving practice when it began to rain as I went down the highway. I flipped on the windshield wipers and discovered they'd been coated with grimy motor oil. It smeared across the windshield and completely obscured my vision. Fortunately, the road was empty enough. I was able to slam the brakes and pull to the side without getting in an accident. Other things started happening too. Less severe, but sinister given the context above. Somebody cut out a bunch of metal militia skull designs and tacked them to our wall or pushed them under the door at night. Furniture was stolen off the porch, my boots vanished when I left them out there, and oddly, several pounds of weed in a plastic sack appeared on our porch one morning. My mom called the manager to get it, without going outside. For once in her life, the lady did something useful and actually fetched it and threw it in the dumpster. I have never felt so helpless in my life. What was I going to do? Call the police. It was around this time that a friend who lived abroad suggested I come stay with him for a while for my own safety. 
dropped out of school and left the country for six months while the lawsuit worked its way through the courts. My mother and brother moved in with family and then to another town without submitting a forwarding address. Eventually, my tourist visa ran out and I had to come home. I was a complete nervous wreck and I ended up settling out of court for a relatively small sum of money just to make it be over. My lawyer got a copy of the search warrant they'd used. It was riddled with grammatical errors and, and switched between my apartment number, 18, and the number of the unit down the street at random. The suspect was somebody with an entirely different name, who looked entirely different from any of us, and who had apparently sold some Oxycontin pills. She lived in Unit 25. I saw a copy of her driver's license. It said right on the front of it, in nice clear letters, Unit 25 inches as her address. I don't know, I have no proof, but it was obvious that somebody had been tipping off our drug dealers downstairs, and I often wonder if the wrong number on that warrant was not a mistake at all. Perhaps it was meant as retaliation for trying to get their friends in trouble. I've now regained full use of my hand, which my doctor had told me might never happen. I no longer have a heart attack at loud noises, and I only feel slightly uneasy when I see police uniforms rather than having full-on panic attacks. It's six years later, and I'm only now beginning to reclaim my life, kick the PTSD, and going back to finish school. I feel like I lost the best part of my 20s to these jerks, and I'm still bitter about it. I currently live with friends in an informal situation. My real address is not on any documentation, and I get all my mail in a P.O. box in another town. Depending on which document you're looking at, I supposedly live in five different places scattered from one end of the county to the other. And I'm not going to change that until I move a lot further away from where this all happened. As far as I know, nobody involved ever faced any sort of consequences. This is a story of mine from high school. When I was 12, a new neighbor moved in with her two sons. To avoid using real names, I'll call them Peter and Paul. Peter was a little developmentally challenged and generally awkward, but I had a little crush on him and we hung out a lot. His brother, who was a year behind me, was quiet and sort of odd. He just had serial killer vibes, even at 11. So the years go by. Peter and I stop hanging out because we got older and hung out with other people. You know the drill, but Paul just sort of lingered. We all went to the same high school about 15 minutes outside of the neighborhood. He would just be everywhere I was. I was at my locker. He was around the corner, looking. I was eating lunch outside with my friends, and he was a table over, looking. He was in the stairwell every time I changed classes. I swear he had my schedule memorized. So in my senior year, I finally got used to it. He seemed harmless, and I was fine with just letting him be for a few more months. Plus, as every girl knows, rejecting guys can be dangerous. Yeah, he's harmless now, but Paul was a big dude. He could have beat me to a pulp if he really wanted. Just because he was the silent, creepy type didn't mean he couldn't go full Cujo. I resolved to leave him be and let him stalk away. I think he noticed I stopped caring, and for some reason, that made him ramp it up. I started getting texts from an unknown number. It started with simple hellos. Then it moved to photos of various body parts. An arm, a hand, a calf, then a full-on pic of, well, you know. Then it moved to photos of my house at night. Progressively, they got worse until I had a picture of myself sitting on my bed, shot from my bedroom window. At this point, I wanted to call the police, but I felt so bad. His mom is a really nice lady, and like I said, I used to have a thing for his brother. What kind of asshole am I if I reported him to the cops? He'd never get into college, never get a girlfriend, and a bunch of other stuff you probably can't get if you've been convinced of stalking and sending inappropriate photos. So I kept letting it slide. Huge mistake. It was a Sunday morning, so no school, and I slept in late. My mom was at church and my dad got dragged along with her, so I had the house to myself. The doorbell rang. I got up, pissed off as one would be when the doorbell wakes them up at 9 a.m. on a Sunday, and there's an envelope on my doorstep. 
Obviously, the mailman isn't coming on Sunday, and he's not dropping letters on my front porch with no address or stamp either. I felt super uncomfortable, and I felt like I was being watched. I grabbed the envelope, shut the door, and locked it. Then I went around and checked and locked all the other doors and windows. Inside was a rambling manifesto-style love letter in full-on serial killer handwriting with a chunk of his hair inside. It still had the roots. He seriously ripped a chunk out to send to me. At this point, I was losing my shit. This was creepy turned up to 11. I went over to his house and explained the situation to his mom, who of course was horrified and apologized. I felt bad snitching, but at this point, it was unhealthy for him and really scary for me. I went back home and felt a lot better having just woo manned up and dealt with it. So then Valentine's Day rolls around. This is when it hit the fan. I woke up at around 2 a.m. on February 14th. I usually sleep through the night really well, but somebody was touching me. It was Paul standing over me with a pair of scissors, cutting my hair. I froze in fear for a solid 30 seconds before we made eye contact. I didn't even scream, I was just petrified. And what does he do? He smiled. Not like a regular smile, though. I swear to God, his entire face stretched. It was the scariest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. He snipped off the chunk of hair he was holding and just walked out of my room into the hallway. At that point, I started screaming at the top of my lungs for my dad. He ran in, obviously freaked out, and went for his gun, and my mom ran in to see what happened. The police went to talk to him the next day, and he ended up being let off with a warning which is pretty bull if you ask me. He literally broke into my house and cut my hair while I slept. What's even worse is I got the feeling he'd been in my room when I didn't know before. I'd been finding Snickers wrappers in the back of my closet for months. I hate Snickers. I just figured it was one of my friends being a slob. His family ended up moving a few weeks later. His poor mom was so embarrassed she couldn't even talk to my family. I feel bad for her. It wasn't her fault. I think he was just wired a little... wrong. That's the story of my Valentine stalker. Remember to lock your doors and windows tonight. I started college in August of 2001. I was fresh out of a relationship from before I graduated the previous May and wanted to meet someone. Admittedly, I was just ready to fall for a girl who would give me the time of day and a pretty smile. This turned out to be true for a girl I'll call Allie. I met Allie in one of my classes. She was a very pretty girl with light brown hair and green eyes. She had this low-key cuteness to her that I was just drawn to. Her and I started to talk one day and we exchanged numbers at one point. Things looked up, it seemed like. One day I glanced over at her and she gave me a sort of flirty look and looked away, then looked back at me again with a bigger smile. I thought she liked me, so one day I remember hinting at something like asking her out. I can't recall what she said, but the next day she handed me a note that said something like, I thought you could just be friends with someone and that's it. There were other things said in the note I can't recall, but I definingly recalled the stay out of my life and leave me alone. I was broken over this, but I ended up just pushing it away and not wanting to make a scene or cause any more harm, I left Allie alone. The fall came and went, and I remember the beginning of that November. My uncle unexpectedly passed away, so my life was wrapped up in making sense of that, and of course the coming end of the semester with which would come final exams. I barely breathed a word to Allie until one day right before Thanksgiving break, she approached me in the library. I looked up from the computer I was at and she said, Hey, I just want to say have a good Thanksgiving. I returned the greeting and she smiled shyly and walked away. I felt like I was over her at this point, so I just thought nothing of it. Christmas came and went and not long after Christmas, I got a card in the mail. It was a greeting card from Allie. It said that she hoped I would have a Merry Christmas she was sorry for what she had said earlier that year. 
I wrote a card back to her that said I accepted her apology, and I hope she had a good Christmas and a good spring semester. I forgot the rest of what I wrote, but not long after, she saw me in the commons area and approached me and thanked me for the nice card. Somewhere in that interaction, we set up a night to see a movie together. We met one night and saw the movie. Everything was fluid and smooth that night. I felt good that I was patching up this barely friendship I had with Allie. At the end of the date, I walked her to her car and asked her for a kiss, if it wasn't asking for much which she agreed to. We said our goodbyes, kissed on the cheek, and that was that. I was over the moon on the drive home, and I felt good enough to try to call her a couple days after that. She didn't answer, which was okay. At this point, Valentine's Day was near, so I tried a couple more times to call her and ask her out to dinner on Valentine's Day, which she never picked up. Day before Valentine's Day, I got a single white rose to give her at campus, and the next morning, I got to school early and waited for her. I sat up in the commons area where I could see her walk in at. I saw her, and she locked eyes with me horrified. My heart started to break when I saw the deer in the headlights look in her eyes. Still, I left where I sat and searched for her, and found her in the cafeteria sitting with the guy I went to school with. She had told me she was friends with him previously, so this was no surprise. I approached her and gave her the rose and said, Hi, I just wanted to give you this. She looked up at me horrified and the guy said, Ali, that was nice of him. You should take it. She took it from me and said, You shouldn't have. It was cold and unwelcome. I felt the rest of my heart break into little pieces, and accepting this defeat, I said, well, happy Valentine's Day. I turned and walked out of the cafeteria, and when my classes were done that day, I went home and sobbed. I got over her again. This time, I left her alone entirely. A year or two later, I had a class with someone who knew her. She asked me, Do you know Allie? I said, Yeah, I know her. And my classmate said, You must have really bothered her because she saw me talking to you one day and said, why are you talking to him? He's a freaking weird. So basically, my barely budding romance with her was dead. I never talked to her again after that. A year after the classmate told me what Allie thought of me, I graduated, and that was it. Then, in 2015, my wife and I were at a rental facility for a friend's wedding. When we went to set up, we approached the counter where the workers would sit. And there was Allie. I don't know if she recognized me or not, but she looked at me. Not a smile or a frown, but a I know you look. And she still looked the same. The same low-key cuteness and the bright eyes. Allie, if you're out there somewhere, please know I meant you no harm. I'm sorry if I scared you. Please forgive me. I hope and pray that you are doing well. When I was a kid, I had a lot of bad luck with creepy people, especially around my best friend. Most of my worst childhood experiences happened when I was with her on the various trips we took together, but those are stories for another time. First, let me set the scene for you. My best friend moved away from our hometown in Virginia to Alabama when we were in the second grade. However, we were determined to stay in contact. We called each other almost every night and sent letters back and forth and drove our parents crazy with questions about when we would be able to see each other in person again. Eventually, both our sets of parents agreed to me spending a few weeks in the summer down in Alabama. My dad drove me down to Tennessee where my friend and her father met me and then they drove me down to Alabama. Her parents weren't home often because they both worked, so that left me, my friend, and her little brother in the care of a babysitter. She was basically a nanny with how often she cared after all of us, but we didn't mind. In our minds, she was the pinnacle of coolness. She was in her early twenties with long blonde hair, a slender build, and a slow southern drawl. I don't remember her name, but I think it was something like Callie. One day, Callie took the three of us to the Air and Space Museum. I remember it was a scorching hot day kind of day that made most people want to stay at home in the air conditioning, or at least take a dip in a pool. So naturally, 
Us being three young children, we complained almost the entire time until Callie agreed to make a stop at Sonic on the way home, only under the condition that we had to eat outside as she didn't want any food in her car. Now, I'm not sure if all Sonics look like this because there are none in my area, but there was this little outdoor eating area covered in shade and a drive through setup on the side of the building. Callie dropped us off in the outdoor section to claim a table while she went through the drive through to order. The place was basically abandoned, I guess, because no one wanted to eat outside in such hot weather. Except for one man. Just by looking at this man, it was pretty easy to tell that he was homeless. His clothes were dirty and ill-fitting. He was scrawny and had a scraggly-looking beard that was the color of rust with tinges of white here and there. He was sitting at the table next to us, sipping on a drink. I didn't give him much thought at first as my friend and I chatted away, but he obviously noticed us. I was shocked when he approached us and tried to start a conversation. It was so sudden, I had no idea how to respond, but I didn't suspect anything bad. I was the type of eight-year-old who thought adults were always right, and it's not good to question one. Plus, I was really shy. My friend, however, wasn't and did most of the talking. While he spoke to us, I noticed a few things. First, he seemed rather... jumpy. His eyes were wide and he occasionally scanned the area, as if he was nervous. It almost made me think he was scared of us for some reason. Secondly, all his attention was on me and my friend, completely ignoring her brother. While I had some of his attention, my friend had even more. I should explain here that my friend hit puberty earlier and harder than most of our peers. She was way more developed than I was, but she was still adverse to wearing a bra, even though she probably needed one. You can probably guess where his eyes were glued to. Finally, Callie had gotten the food and parked the car and made her way back to us. As soon as she spotted us, she practically came running and stood in between us and the man. She handed us our food and politely, but aggressively, asked the man who he was. I didn't understand at the time why the friendly Callie was being anything less than her cheery self, but it scared me. The man introduced himself as Charlie and tried to strike up conversation with Callie. I don't remember his exact words, but I do remember feeling uncomfortable at what he was saying to her. It was far more blunt and flirtatious than it was when he was talking to us, but again, being so young, I didn't really understand it. Whatever he said must have freaked Callie out because she quickly herded us up and whispered, We're eating in the car. No questions. We were all confused, but quickly made our way to her car. Charlie, however, followed us the entire way, getting more and more aggressive the more Callie tried to end the conversation. At this point, we finally realized that whatever was happening wasn't good so we rushed to get inside the car. Charlie made a grab for Callie, but she got into the car before he could and quickly slammed the door and locked it. Charlie gripped onto the door handle and pulled hard. The entire time, he had this wide grin on his face. Even remembering it now, it sends chills down my spine. When the door wouldn't open, he lifted a hand and tapped a finger on the glass, pointing down to the door silently asking Callie to open it. Callie freaked. She started the car and backed up while he was still hanging onto the door handle. She then attempted to run over his foot, and this is when he finally let go. She drove away and frantically called her boyfriend in the car while we kids ate our food in confusion. She told my friend's parents what happened, who in turn told my parents, but I don't know if the police were contacted. It's been over a decade since this happened, and the last thing I heard about Callie was that she married her boyfriend a few years after this incident. Wherever she is, I'll forever be grateful for how protective she was over us. This just occurred a few years ago in November. A close friend and I were on fall break from college and decided to go to an Odessa concert in downtown Chicago. We grew up in the suburbs, so going to Chicago to have fun was common for us. We had a great time at the concert and decided to Uber home since we weren't close to the train station. 
My friend told me Uber wasn't working for him at the moment, so I called the Uber. But this was literally my first time ever calling one, and I accidentally called an Uber pool, not knowing what it was. My friend saw that and was like, it doesn't really matter. So the driver picks us up from right outside the concert venue. There were a lot of intoxicated people around, as one could imagine post-Odessa show, but we were pretty sober as all we did was smoke some weed, which we were used to. We get in the car and everything is going normal, but we didn't notice the direction the driver was taking as we were wrapped up in talking about the show. Turns out, the driver was going to the south side of Chicago, which we realized after some time by looking at maps. But our suburb was exactly the opposite direction of this lengthy drive south. We decided to attribute this to the fact that it was an Uber pool and shrugged it off until we picked up this next passenger. TBH, this girl scared us. I don't like to judge people, but she scared us just by looks and how she talked. Once the girl got in, we asked the driver where we were going first, to which he stopped answering. Next thing I know, my phone lit up and said the Uber trip was canceled. And for this duration of the ride, Uber had no record of me being in the car. I asked the driver what the deal was and he didn't answer. The girl and the driver 100% knew each other as they were calling each other nicknames. The girl was being weird and seemed to be doing some hand signals to him. Then we proceeded to drive further south to this neighborhood, the sketchiest neighborhood I've ever seen. I didn't realize neighborhoods like this even existed. Every house was completely wrecked. There were no street signs on most streets. Most streetlights were out, flickering. Homeless people lying on sidewalks, and there were beat down warehouses and alleys. This was by far the scariest area I'd ever seen. No one who cared would hear a scream in this area. Once we started seeing all of this, our hearts dropped because the driver would still not respond to us. My friend then looks over to me and whispers, we need to get the fuck out of here. To which I replied, dude, look where we are. And so we stayed in the car. Then the, we get driven down this alley behind a warehouse where the streets ended and there were just fields beyond it. The driver is going down this alley at like two miles per hour, but keeps going. The girl and Uber driver were clearly discussing something serious but we couldn't make it out since they were using mostly signals. At that time, our hearts sank even more, and we literally both thought we were going to be killed in this alley, or at best, someone was going to get in the car and rob us. He stopped, the doors unlocked, and I was in complete shock with a pale face when all of a sudden my friend says, Hey, I'm completely sober, and I'm about to fucking call 911, which he was serious about. He had 911 dialed up on his phone. The Uber driver looks back at us in shock after he sees 911 dialed and my friend's finger about to push call. He looks at the girl. The girl is in shock too, and she nods her head no, says what the f cry as she gets out of the car. The driver then drives out of the neighborhood and onto the highway towards our suburb. All of a sudden, my Uber app gave me a notification saying we were now in a ride. All of a sudden, the driver starts talking to us again, but he wasn't giving any answers, just saying he's driving us home. We were asking WTF just happened, dude, and he just wouldn't answer stuff like that. He would answer about where we're going, but nothing about what just happened. We got home safely and reported the Uber driver for this ride because it was obviously messed up. We think that the Uber driver was trying to wait for wasted people to call a pool so he could get away with this but realized we were too big of a risk when it came time to do what they were going to do. We've accepted that we were part of a mugging scheme and got lucky we decided to not get drunk at the concert. We had anxiety for weeks after this, but we now know just how sketchy some areas can be and how to be more safe in Chicago by not calling an Uber pool outside a concert bar. It's so weird to me that people live this sketchy of lives and do this to people, but it was eye-opening. We contacted Uber right away and told them about the driver and the situation we went through, and they told us they were going to look into it, apologized, and that the driver was out of line to go the way he did. Hopefully they did something about it. We didn't call the cops, but we should have. We were stoned and in shock, hoping that Uber would take action, 
and we didn't really think about it too thoroughly since we were freaking out and wanted to go to sleep. Needless to say, I'm using Lyft for future driving assistance. Thinking about the fact that other people could have been hurt is horrifying. We were naive about calling the cops, and I feel bad about that. We just wanted it to be over because of how much anxiety it gave us. I think we were trying to convince ourselves that this was going to be okay, and cops didn't need to get involved. If I were to do it again, I would call the cops when the ride got dropped. This was around 2009. I live in Rhode Island, which is pretty small and lived very sheltered. I got my first laptop around this time. Every day after school, my group of friends and I would log on to AIM and talk about school, boys, you know, usual middle school things. I don't know if any of you remember, but there was AIM public groups where you could meet strangers. That's where my story begins. A group of my friends and I went into a public AIM group, just being stupid making jokes, sharing YouTube videos. One guy takes a certain interest in me and he adds me so we can talk privately. I don't remember what we talked about really. School, anime, about my friends. Looking back, I think he was grooming me, but nothing seemed off about it then. He was a 32-year-old black man. I can't remember his name for the life of me. He lived in a neighboring state of Connecticut, which isn't too far. I had hoped to meet him since he was really nice to me. I was young and was being bullied in school, so anyone online seemed like an escape. He and I talked about Vocaloid. It wasn't as popular back then, but I was so excited to have a friend who liked what I did. Things went by normal for a while. I used to do YouTube videos and he had me subscribed on my old account. I even showed him a song called Luca Luca Night Fever, he put it into his favorites. I was so happy. But one day he began being different. He asked to call me on the phone. I was one of the only kids in my class who didn't have a cell phone, and I didn't want my family to catch me on the house phone with a stranger. I politely said, I can't, sorry. To this day I remember his answer. Call me or I will and murder you. I was sheltered, like I said. I panicked, my throat clenched up and I threw up. I blocked him immediately. I should have called the cops. I should have told my mom. But I didn't. I was so afraid that I had done something wrong, that they wouldn't take me seriously, that I would have my computer taken away. He knew I was in middle school. As soon as he had realized what I had done, he sent AIM spam bots on me. It was to the point where it crashed my computer. They all had obscene sexual names. I made a new account on AIM and pretty much forgot about him. I log onto YouTube one day and I see I have a new message, expecting it to be my friend from Sweden, another young girl around my age. I get excited and quickly open it. My heart sinks. It's him. I still remember his YouTube. He's still active on it today. He says something along the lines of, Hey, my cousin got that Vocaloid program. Unblock me and I can send you a copy. I knew that I couldn't ever forgive what he had said. I was scared of him. I didn't block him on YouTube, though. I'm not sure why. I don't know if I knew how to back then. The messages keep coming, but I never answer them. They're all, I miss you so much. I'm sorry. At one point, I think he says he loves me. I eventually lose interest in my YouTube account since it was under my real initials and last name. I make one under a fake name to protect myself. I had a lot more subs on my old account, so I decided to log in and upload a video saying I was back. This was three or four years ago. The minute I do, I get a message from him. I missed you, baby. You're so beautiful. I check his YouTube channel. There's that damn song, Luca Luca Night Fever, featured on his page. I delete the messages. I delete every video. Every time I get a message request on Facebook, YouTube, anything. I get anxious and worried it's him. To this day, I've never gone to CT no matter how much I want to. I'm always afraid he will recognize my face and approach me. I have no other contact with him. AIM is gone, and I never used that user since. And my YouTube was deleted by YouTube itself after I put in a claim. Admittedly, I am very naive. I always think the best of people. 
I never think people are purposely malicious. I'm very glad I never gave out my address, because I think he genuinely would have hurt me. Will you be my valentines? The message notification popped up on my phone, glaring at me in the dark of my room. Anxiety bubbled in my stomach as I stared at the text until the screen went black. I felt a chill down my spine as that same no-name number flashed in my head. A number that no matter what I did, didn't ever seem to stay blocked for long. This message was nowhere close to the strangest one I had been receiving from this number for the past year, but it still caused me to feel uneasy and anxious. The whole situation made me want to cry, because despite being constantly harassed and borderline stalked by the person on the other end, there was nothing I could do. They had never outright threatened my safety, nor was I in any immediate danger, so the police wouldn't do anything. Besides, it's hard to get a restraining order against someone you don't know. When I received my first message from the number, it was probably a day or two after Valentine's Day of last year. It read, Hi. I just wanted to wish you a happy late Valentine's Day. Love you. To which I replied, Thanks you too, but I think you have the wrong number. In hindsight, I wish I had never responded, but I thought it was just a harmless mishap. I didn't want to be rude, and I find it quite normal to wish someone a happy Valentine's Day without there being any romantic relation between you and the other person. That there, had initiated the start of a very stressful and anxiety-filled year. The messages that followed after that were pretty normal at the start, however. The person would ask me how I was and how my day was going. Again, I thought it was harmless, so I engaged in small talk with them, asking them in return how they were and how their day was. Somewhere along the line, though, I had gotten really busy with both my work and personal life and stopped message them as often. This seemed to spark their obsessiveness as whenever I would check my contacts, I would see 10 plus unread messages they had sent me. From asking me normal questions and asking if I was fine, but soon they started asking me about things I never told them. This behavior had honestly creeped me out, so I stopped replying to them all together and blocked them. I thought it was a done deal, but a few days later, I'd see them at the top of my contacts list with dozens of unread messages. In the span of a few days, the messages had gone from just slightly obsessive to full-blown obsessive and even possessive in a sense. From that point on, they'd constantly message me about things they imagines us doing together, send me messages of their love for me, and would even sometimes insult me for the lack of my responses. But one thing stayed the same. They always asked me about things they shouldn't have known about, as if warning me that they were watching me. No matter what I did, they never stayed blocked. After mulling over everything, I found myself more angry than anxious. I quickly opened up the contact, and before I could even second-guess myself, I typed out a very not-so-well-thought-out message and sent it. No, I don't want to be your Valentines, and I never will. I have no idea who you are, but... I do know that you sicken me. Every time I see your messages, I feel anxious and nauseous. You are nothing but an obsessive creep who has filled my past year with stress, fear, and annoyance. Please don't ever contact me again, or I will involve the police. I'm serious. I stared at the screen, holding my breath as I waited to see if they would respond, but after about 30 minutes, there was still nothing. I let out the breath I was holding, but despite the lack of response, I still didn't feel all that relieved. Anxiety and fearful anticipation flooded my nerves, making sleeping all the harder. Not wanting to dwell on it anymore, I blocked the number for hopefully the last time and placed my phone down. I would not allow this person to scare me any longer. The next day, it was Valentine's Day. A lovely day for couples that I would have loved to celebrate by treating myself to something nice. But unfortunately, I had a lot of work to do. The message from last night had been long since forgotten as I headed into work, feeling more at ease than ever before. I guess some part of me figured that everything was over now, and I could rest easy without having to worry about the unknown person. Regardless, I went throughout my day as usual, 
albeit it was a bit more busy than usual due to an approaching deadline. I worked late at night, not leaving the office until 9 p.m. As I walked out to my car, I couldn't help but feel uneasy. There were only two other cars in the parking lot, both of which were far from mine, and it was extremely dark. Each step I took echoed out into the night, which only helped increase my paranoia. I slowly glanced around as I felt I was being watched. For a moment, I had thought back to the person behind the no-name number, and my blood ran cold. I hurriedly picked up my pace and shook my head, trying to convince myself I was just being paranoid. I wanted to believe that I was tired from a long day at the office. As I reached my car, I fumbled with my keys momentarily before unlocking my door. As I was about to get in, I heard rapid footsteps coming up behind me, and before I could even turn around, something hard connected with my head. My vision spotted as pain exploded in my skull. As I crumpled to the ground, my vision went black. I was unconscious. It was some time late when I startled awake with a pounding headache and slightly blurred vision. I was in a state of confusion and panic as I looked around, trying to see where I was. My arms and legs wouldn't move how I wanted them to, causing my panic to worsen. I looked down at the duct tape that painfully bounded my limbs to the chair I was seated in. In my confused panic, I didn't even realize there was someone else in the room with me until they spoke. Hello, Katie. I froze as the voice sounded oddly familiar, but in my painful and confused haze, I couldn't put a face to the name. Instead, I turned my attention in the direction of the voice and was met with a masked man leaning against a table off to the side of me. My vision was clearing and I could clearly see I was most likely in a basement of some kind. Who... who are you and what do you want from me? I asked, my voice hesitant and shaking. He laughed, but he didn't sound amused in the slights. I'm hurt, Katie, truly. I thought you'd recognize me from my voice, but I guess not. I... If you show me your F face, perhaps I'd recognize you, I replied. Don't, he said, slamming a hand down on the table. Play games with me. I jumped as tears pricked at my eyes. I'm n not. Please. I, I truly don't know who y you are. Please just l let me go. I promise I won't s say a word. He stood from the table and began pacing back and forth in front of me. No, no, no. See, I was nice. I messaged you every day. I asked how you were, asked how your day was, asked about your job and family, told you about what I wanted to do with you. And finally, when I had gained enough confidence, I asked you out for Valentine's Day. He stopped in front of me before kneeling down to be at my eye level. But what did you do? You said I sicken you. You called me an obsessive creep when all I did was show my love for you. I shrank away from him as much as I could as tears rolled down my face. Realization hit me as I now knew that he was the stalker. He was the one who sent me all those messages. I felt sick to my stomach as thoughts of what he would to do me raced through my mind. He furrowed his brows before wiping a tear off my face before standing back up. The haze I felt was starting to clear away as my brain worked over time trying to figure out who he was and what he was going to do with me. He had to be someone I know, someone who knew where I worked and about my personal issues. I felt winded as I started putting the pieces together. With the evidence laid out in front of me and his voice as the clue, I felt horrified. You, you're Jared! Jared from the G-Group Therapy! But, but why? Why, Jared? If you liked me, you, you could have just said so! I asked, desperation bleeding into my quivering words. You wouldn't understand he said, removing his mask. I was infatuated with you, but you would have never looked my way. So instead, I needed to contact you and not have you aware of who was. That way you wouldn't have any preconceived notions about me. I've loved you for so long, poured my heart out to you, but you never returned my feelings. Instead, you spat in my face and pierced my heart with those sharp words of yours. But it's okay. I know how to fix this. Since you don't love me, and I can't have you with anyone else, I'll just kill you. 
He glared at me with eyes that petrified me. This was longer the same Jared I knew. Madness was apparent in his eyes as a small but sadistic smile was spread across his face. I wanted to scream and shout at him, but I knew that would not help me. I needed to calm down and appeal to his feelings. I needed to convince him that I loved him back. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath before opening them again and staring at Jared with both sympathy and fondness. Jared, please listen to me. I had no idea that the person messaging me was you. I'm so sorry that I hurt you and betrayed your trust, but I honestly didn't know it was you. I thought it was a stranger who was stalking me. You have to understand. If I knew it was you, I wouldn't have acted that way. I would have happily returned your feelings. I watched the sadistic smile fall as his eyes became normal once more. His face softened light as he seemed to be mulling what I said over. Jared, I continued on, my voice softer and more calm than before. Now that I know, I would love to be your Valentines if you'll have me. I'm so sorry for what I said, but I'd really love to spend some time with you and do some of the things you had said you wanted to do together. Like cooking, you wanted to cook together, right? If you'll allow it, I'd love to cook for you, as an apology. A small, genuine small broke out on his face. Really? You want to be my Valentines? Yes, I'll cook you something nice as well. You just have to release me from these, I said, nodding at my bindings. No, you'll just leave me, he responded, his face hardening once more. I shook my head. No, Jared, I won't. I promise. To be honest, I've had feelings for you as well. I was just unsure if you felt the same. After all, we only conversed a bit after group therapy and you didn't seem interested. So, Jared, I promise you when I say I'll stay with you. Prove it, he replied. Prove to me that you'll stay. Prove to me that you love me as well. I bit my lip as a thought passed through my mind and I decided to go with it. Kiss me, Jared. That seemed to surprise him as his eyes widened and he just stared me. What? what Kiss me. I'll prove it to you that way. He smiled once more and nodded as he kneeled down in front of me. As he leaned in, I closed my eyes and waited for our lips to connect. I tried to put as much passion I could into the kiss, all while keeping the nausea I felt down. As he pulled away, I smiled at him to which he returned with a big smile. Without me even saying anything more, he pulled a knife from his belt and sliced through the tape holding me in place. I felt somewhat relieved as I rubbed at the red marks on my wrists. I bared had time to process anything as he pulled me after him as he led me up the stairs and into his living room. I followed, trying to be as happy as possible and laughing along with him. I knew it! I knew you'd get it! You just needed to know that it was me! I'm so happy, Katie! He exclaimed as he led me through the living room and into the kitchen. I am too, Jared. I'm glad that we are together. I responded, coming to a stop by the kitchen table which I used to steady myself. I grit my teeth as I waited for the dizziness to subside and prayed the dull pounding would stop. Well, let's get started cooking, he said. Uh, mister, I said I'd cook for you and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Go into the living room and relax, you must be tired. I replied with a small laugh. I nodded. Yeah, but did you bring my purse with us? Yeah. Why? He asked. Can you get it for me? I have a slight headache and I have some ibuprofen in my purse, I explained, smiling before pecking him on the cheek. He smiled and immediately left the kitchen to get it. While he was gone, I got busy gathering the necessary ingredients for breakfast. It wasn't even five minutes late when he returned with my purse. I smiled and thanked him before shooing him out of the kitchen. Ensuring that he was actually gone and not watching, I opened my purse and pulled out a bottle of my sleeping pills. I got to work cooking the breakfast ingredients I could find. I knew from the small conversations with Jared that breakfast was his favorite. It didn't take me long to get it all ready as I started plating it. I ladled a big spoonful of grits into a bowl that was separate from everything else. I quickly took a few of my sleeping pills and crushed them before adding them to the bowl of grits. 
Not wanting to get suspected of anything, I hastily shoved them back into my purse and set the table. Jared, the food is ready, I called out as I sat down. He came in and lit up at the food. Wow, thanks Katie, this looks so good. Before he sat, he planted a kiss on my head which I kindly smiled in return. As we ate, I carefully observed, anxious that at any moment he'd figure out my plan. I was thankful that I always kept my sleeping pills in my purse. They could very well be the thing that helps me to escape. We engaged in light conversation all the while I was trying to hide the fear that threatened to make me hurl the food I was eating. I just had to keep this act up for a little longer. Just a little longer. I know from experience that adding these particular sleeping pills to food increased the drowsiness effect along with a few others. We soon finished our food, and I sent Jared back to the living room while I cleaned the dishes. It was partially so that hopefully he'll fall asleep soon, and so I could stay away from him for as long as possible. Once the dishes were done, I slowly made my way into the living room and to where Jared was seated on the couch. I went to sit beside him, seeing as how he looked to fighting to stay awake, but was starting to fail. Are you tired? I asked. Yeah, yeah, I am, he answered. Come, lay your head on my lap. Rest, you deserve it, I said with a smile. He nodded slowly and laid down. I absent-mindedly ran my fingers through his hair in a soothing manner. I watched TV as my nerves screamed at me. He turned, looking up at me, which caused me to stare down at him. Will you stay with me? He asked, his words starting to slur together. I smiled and laughed slightly. Of course I won't leave you. He returned my smile and closed his eyes. I sat there for what felt like an eternity, playing in his hair, waiting for him to fully fall asleep. It wasn't until about 40 minutes later that I was confident he wouldn't wake up from me moving. Carefully, I slid out from underneath him and replaced my lap with a pillow. I quickly searched his pants pockets, making sure his car keys weren't on him. Upon not finding any, I made my way to the kitchen and grabbed my purse and looked for them there. I went back to the living room and searched around before finding them on the table by the door. I almost breathed a sigh of relief, but my paranoia of it waking him prevented me from doing so. I unlocked the door, and before I opened it, I paused. I need evidence if I was to go to the police. With that thought, I headed back down to the basement and took a few pictures of the chair that I was strapped to not even two hours ago. The same chair that could easily have been where I would die. The thought made my stomach churn, so I disregarded it and begun searching the rest of his house. I went through each room, not finding anything. I was becoming discouraged until I found a locked room on the second floor. I pulled out his keys and tried each one until I found one that unlocked the door. Opening the door, I turned the light on and stood in horror of what I saw. There were dozens of pictures of me pinned to walls with hearts drawing on them. There were pictures of me cut out and pasted onto pictures that he had of himself. There were love letters that spoke volumes of his obsessive and possessive behavior. Pushing my unease and nausea down, I took multiple photos of all of it and quickly made my way back down the stairs and out the front door. I didn't even bother closing it behind me as I rushed to his truck. In fear of waking him, I unlocked the drive side door with the key. Getting in, I put the truck in neutral and let off the brake to allow it to roll down the small incline of his driveway onto the road. Once I was out enough, I turned the truck on and put it in drive, not daring to look back. I floored it to the police station with my flashers on, allowing myself to release the breath I was holding. Tears fell down my face as I rushed into the police station and yelled for help. Officers rushed to me and I showed them the bruising on my wrists and the photos I took while explaining what happened. That was enough to send them to Jared's house while I was taken to the hospital due to my head injury, which was thankfully not as serious as I thought. I couldn't stop crying from both relief and that I actually made it out. It wasn't until the next morning that I heard that Jared was successfully arrested and in jail after having been still asleep until the cops showed up. 
He wasn't happy and had gone insane and practically uncontrollable as he shouted about how he was going to kill me and that I was a traitor. That was the final straw that finally convinced me to move out of this city. I had already been offered a job opportunity in a different state, but I was hesitant with deciding what to do. After this, however, I needed to desperately get away. Jared was in jail at the moment, but one day he'll be out, and I wanted to be like a ghost when he did. I accepted the job as soon as I got out of the hospital and started packing immediately. This event truly showed me that you never truly know a person. You don't know what they'll do to you or anyone else, and that horrified me. While Jared's intentions probably started off pure, somewhere down the line he became obsessive and downright horrifying. He is my very own Valentine's horror story, and I don't think I'll ever be able to the view the holiday the same again. I live in England, and I was a 21-year-old female in my third year of university. My boyfriend and I lived about two minutes away, and we often stayed at each other's houses, although there wasn't an exact routine to it. The city we lived in wasn't known for being particularly safe, but I never once felt threatened. Although I was a country girl at heart, I never took unnecessary risks, but even walking through typically unsafe parks in the dark after choir, I was never given reason to be alarmed. My boyfriend lived in a house with three other guys, one of whom dropped out halfway through the year. The house had a previous history of break-ins, and just before they rented, it had a new lock fitted on the front door. The previous year, a burglar had actually knocked the door down, despite it facing a busy street. That being the case, everyone was pretty diligent in locking the doors, whether we were inside or not. On the night in question, my boyfriend was out at his band rehearsal, having left at 6.30 p.m., 18.30, and his two remaining housemates left to go to the pub at 8 p.m. I wasn't much of a drinker, so I opted to stay home, and in the blissful hour to myself, I decided to have a shower. Now I'm in my uni choir and I absolutely adore singing, so I grabbed my phone and speaker and headed to the bathroom. I don't often get the chance to really blast it out when people are in the house, out of consideration for them, so I was relishing the opportunity. My phone was at about 15%, but I figured it'd last for the majority of my time in there. I could just charge it up when I get out. So I'm in the shower, having an absolute banger of a time, when my phone predictably dies about 20 minutes in. I was done washing a few minutes ago, so I just get out and get dry and head to my my boyfriend's room. As soon as I walked out of the bathroom, I got this feeling that something wasn't right. I was home alone, but I had this horrible, tense feeling like I wasn't the only one in the house, even though the house was absolutely silent for save the slight sound of traffic. I shrugged it out, figuring I'm just being paranoid and dump my stuff on the bed. To give some context, the room is pretty large with a desk opposite the door, large bay windows with curtains drawn across them, and to the left is a large wardrobe. My boyfriend often liked to hang sheets and duvet covers to dry on their open doors, which drove me mad because it looked so untidy. The reason I bring this up is that immediately I felt like something was off. Firstly, my bedroom light was on, and I could have sworn I'd switched it off. And secondly, the sheet hanging on the wardrobe was in a crumpled heap on the floor, and the wardrobe door was shut. Cold shivers ran up and down my body, and honestly, I still get shivers thinking about that moment. The first moment I realized someone was in my room, and I was absolutely, completely defenseless. I froze for a moment or two, and then the thought occurred to me that maybe someone had broken in, as it had happened before, and I had just interrupted them. It seemed the most logical explanation, so I grabbed my phone and made out like someone had called me. Oh, hey, Katie! My voice was too high-pitched and fake, but I carried on with my oh-so-clever ploy. Yeah, I'm just getting ready. I just need to... I cursed and forced a laugh at this point. I cringe at how unconvincing it was, but I was like a cornered rabbit. I forgot to shave my legs. I'll nip and do that now. Talk to you in a second. 
Clutching my dead phone to my chest, I pretty much bolted for the bathroom, locked the door, switched the shower on, and switched off the light. I sat opposite the door, shaking and crying, watching the light streaming in and waiting for the person to pass me and run downstairs. I saw the shadow of their footsteps before they arrived, but instead of going downstairs, they halted just outside the door. I clapped a hand over my mouth to stop myself sobbing out loud, and I swear the creepiest voice I've ever heard rasped. I know you're in there, girl. I tried to shout, but in reality, my voice broke as I said, I'm calling the police right now. The man just laughed and laughed, banging on my door harder and harder until I thought it would break. Then he stopped, and then banging was replaced by something altogether more sinister, a scratching, scraping sound up and down the door. I practically wet myself there and then, trying to find something to defending myself with. All of a sudden, everything stopped, and I could hear him absolutely legging it down the stairs and into the kitchen. Seconds later, I heard the front door bang, and then eventually someone walking up the stairs. I was still holding my makeshift weapons and crying so hard I could barely see when I heard my boyfriend swear, and I finally managed to unlock the door and let him in. Turns out there were grooves all down the door. The man had had a knife. He was scraping down the door with a knife. I made my boyfriend call the police and stay with me till they arrived, even though he wanted to check the house over to make sure the man had actually gone. I was so scared, though, that he ended up sitting in the bathroom with me until they arrived, took a statement, and scanned for prints. It turns out one of the guys had left the back door open when he went to check the meter. That means that whoever snuck in here knew it was left open. We were otherwise very diligent about locking the doors, as I've said, and they knew that no one else but me was in the house. They also must have entered someone's house, whose back gardens face our back garden, or they must have sneaked in the flats next door to climb over the walls separating the properties. If he did that, someone must have let them in. My boyfriend's rehearsal finished about half an hour early, meaning that he was back before the man clearly expected. My only explanation is that he must have had someone outside watching, because that's the only way he'd have had time to bolt down the stairs, in full view of the front door, and out of the back door, still in plain sight, if he hadn't had some prior warning. That means someone else was involved, and I shudder to think what might have happened in the extra half hour he thought he had. The thing that really gets me, though, is that he knew that I'd be at my boyfriend's house, which room I was in, and he'd brought a knife. This wasn't an accident. He'd been watching. He knew where we would all be. And he knew exactly what he was doing. The police found prints, but it wasn't anyone in their system, and they never found him. The bastard's still out there doing who knows what, and no one knows who he is. I know it's not my fault, and if I did anything differently, I might not be here to tell the tale. But I wish I had been able to do something more to identify him and get him off the streets. I can't bear the thought of him succeeding where he failed with me. If you like this story and want to see more, please consider subscribing, liking, and sharing this video.